So um, I, let me um, start by sort of, uh, before getting into uh, the, the paper itself, to lay out sort of the larger conceptual framework for the second book project, uh, which, uh, as Aziz says, is really dealing with the, the Muslim experience, uh, particularly um, Indo-Muslim travelers uh, coming to England in the late 19th century, early 19th century. And in a sense, what that book project is trying to do is, in a sense, compensate for the first one. That is to say that I never really touched upon what were actual Muslims thinking about all these various fantasies and, and enlightenment ideas about Islam that was circulating in this period. So it occurred to me that um, that's also a very important part of the story uh, that, that I think plays two vital roles. I think one of, it, one of them uh, for me is that it really uh, forces us to think carefully about what does it mean to talk about the West um, back then and today, um, a term that in many ways has this solid essentialism that doesn't seem to go away. That is to say that we constantly use it and rehearse it in our language whether in academic discourse, media discourse, political discourse. Um, and it has a very solid hyper-reality. Um, and it seems to have a deep essence, and yet we quite frankly don't know what it means or where it ends and where it begins and what parts of the world it includes. And I think an important way of grasping the genealogy of that concept is to go back to the late 18th century when that concept was very fluid in information. But also keep in mind that uh, it was not just Europeans who were, and particularly you know, the English, who were in the process of thinking of themselves as Western, but actually uh, foreigners of various kinds, and not only Muslims, I might add, whether it could be Hindus, I'm looking at Ar Armenian Christians as well, that were there in the process of defining what Europe means for a Europe that was not quite aware of itself, and for that matter, was quite spectral. It was a Europe that was not there. And that's what I'm calling in my book project an alter Europe a way of recovering various ideas of what it means to talk about a Europe, or what it means to say that Britain in this time period was Western, um, which of course, it's an underlying assumption that in my talk here that that was not quite settled at this period. Um, and we need to think about as a way of complicating these East-West narratives. Um, and I think as, as Aziz's work has demonstrated the fact that, you know, there's a lot of these cultural essentialisms that creep into our language. And I think a good way of trying to defamiliarize that is to go back to the period and think about these alter Europe's, these other versions of Europe that we've lost along the way, but presents us with uh, uh, a, a, different, a different understanding of intercultural relations that I think is worthwhile recovering, of, uh, in, not just in academic discourse, but I think even to think in, in, in political terms uh, of think, you know, sort of working against that paradigm of the clash of civilizations. So that's, that's really in a nutshell what I'm doing. And these, each of these chapters looks at different uh, uh, travel writers uh, of this period. Um, so, I, and, and again, I'm building here on the work of Occidentalist studies uh, in the time period. So people like Sari Magdisi, Alistair Bonnet, uh, Mohammed uh, Tavargi, uh, Targi, um, people that have explored various genealogies of Occidentalism in this period. Um, I will, so I think, you know, for today, I'm going to be focusing on one of these writers, um, uh, Sheikh, uh, uh, Sheikh Mija Itzmedin, Mija Sheikh Itzmedin. Um, and uh, primarily, uh, I'm trying to pitch this talk to those of you who I, I assume in various capacities or, or one way or another are interested in questions of religion. Um, so I'm focusing particularly on what I think is a very rich open field right now worth exploring, which is that, that intersection between uh, religious and performance studies. And, and I'm hoping that that might be one of the takeaway points of my lecture today. Um, for those of you who are working in, in other disciplines and fields and other periods, um, that you might find that illuminating in some way. At least that, that's, what, that's what I'm hoping. So in order to uh, keep that uh, focus in mind, um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm leaving a lot of details out about the London theater in this period, uh, the kind of plays that uh, the Misra saw, um, and, uh, and sort of to keep everything, you know, focused on the question, you know, particularly on the question of religion and performativity. Um, and, uh, I, I, and I, but I'll be glad to return to that in the Q&A session. And I, you know, for those theater buffs out there, you know, if you're out there, you know, I could give you a lot more details on that. Um, also, I'm not going to really get into the question of translation, which is a very strong bearing on my argument. Uh, I think it's worthwhile recognizing that first and foremost, these texts were circulating in translation, and, and, and they had a colonial function. They were very much distorted through various translational and colonial processes. But I'm not, I'm not going to have time to really get into that um, in, in a lot of detail. 
Um, and also I should just uh, say in general uh, disclaimer that I'm not really a Persianist <laughs> or somebody who specializes in Islamic and Arabic studies, although of course I've, I've worked a lot in these areas and I very much rely on, on scholars who do have that expertise. Uh, but, but I have actually been working with a Persian translator, uh, somebody who's translating from, from Persian to English. So I have a lot of insights I can share on that front as well. So let me go ahead and start with sort of the central question that I want to be exploring, uh, which is, you know, to what extent do performances transfer religious emotions, histories, and identities across culture that preclude rather than enable uh, new forms of human interrelatedness, right? Um, this question has been posed and answered several times, right, by uh, dramaturgical theorists such as Victor Turner, Irving Goffman, uh, Clifford Gertz, and of course, more recently, within you know the last couple, you know decades, uh, a lot of you know uh, up and coming scholars and performance studies have also posed this question, and have you know been looking at you know the interdependence of dramatic genres and everyday social dramas, a liminal performative space by which the self is constituted through rituals meant to resolve political and historical crises, and the emphasis usually is on consolidating communities. Right? Uh, I will examine how this social process could also undermine community building by focusing on the life of Mughal emissary Mizra Sheikh Itzamuddin, who wrote a Persian travelogue, uh, Shigraf uh, Nama Vilayat, that is the wonders of Vilayat, or Europe, or, and again, there's a slipperiness term, Europe or England or the mother country, right? So, and, I wanna, and I wanna keep that slipperiness open right, in my discussion. Um, and it's based on his visit to Britain between 1766 and 68. Um, in this work, he distinguishes a spiritualist from a materialist West yet models the civilizational difference after the London entertainments he saw, an intercultural repertoire of social knowledges and habits that helped him reinvent his identity from a ravished admirer of an Islamicized Anglican society to an ascetic Muslim who prefers Indian society. Uh, the late 18th century uh, English theater presents Issa Medin with a liminal space for performing his sh shifting subjectivity in a foreign land. Through embodied affects and reiterative acts, he posits Muslim Protestant commonalities that eventually dissolve into irresolvable conflicts over religious practices between him and what he calls consistently Farangis, that is a Persian term for Franks or Europeans. This social entropy, I argue, suggests that performance is a crucial site not only for transmitting a shared religiosity, but also for imagining the clash of civilization story familiar to us today. To argue that Itz Medin's cross-cultural interactions are mediated by performative genres, on and off stage, is to recognize the pervasive influence of the Georgian theater in this period. Uh, on a diplomatic mission to deliver Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II's letter to King George III, Itz Medin spent his time in Britain visiting popular destinations in Scotland, Oxford, and London, inc including various theatrical venues. He offers vague responses to British entertainments that resonate effectively in his ordinary life and that the events he describes after leaving these venues. Pantomimes, street fairs, dance, and the early circus provide models of theatrical world making for him and for Britons in general that inform social interactions, behaviors, and lived experiences offstage. In this case, the theater allows its Medin to understand a foreign people, Farangis, by performing what Diana Taylor uh, calls the repertoire, the, and she understands the repertoire as this non-archival system, right? It, 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 it exceeds and precedes the written script. Yeah, it's for, you know, and it's in that, you know, for transmitting social knowledge, history, and identities interculturally through embodied affects and reiterative acts. And yet the bizarre social drama the traveler participates in revealed the extent to which colliding cultural repertoires could generate profound misunderstandings and communal breakdowns. As a social entropy, the author subsequently explains in terms of essentialized East-West differences. By using a performative lens to read it to Medin's travelogue, I want to stress two crucial points today. First, that early Indian Occidentalism was forged in the disconnection of cultural repertoires bound by imperial processes. So that's, that's the first point that I want to dwell on. Um, second, that early uh, modern India's Islamic Persianic culture could not always accommodate all uh, social and religious differences, right? Um, contrary to studies that have idealized the Mughal Empire as a bastion of liberal multiculturalism. And that's been a, a trend that's now being called into question in, in, in Persian and, uh, and uh, South Asian studies. 
the first section of my talk considers uh, the Indian traveler's self-fashioning into a black-masked harlequin mime, a racialized self resulting from his odd interactions with what he consistently calls fairy-looking Englishwomen in a Dover ballroom and the London theater. The second section argues that through this racial fantasy, he fuses Protestant and Islamic values, morphing into another persona, a prophet Jesus who rebukes a materialist West for creating an earthly empire as illusory as the one represented on stage. So to move on to my first part, which I've subtitled, A Black Devil Amid Fairy-Faced Englishwoman. It's Medin's shifting and overlapping allegiances to the Mughal emperor, Bengal Indian rulers, and British East India Company officials profoundly shaped his identity. Probably born in 1730, he was raised in Nadia, Bengal, by a noble Sunni Muslim family. A member of the imperial service gentry, he was educated as a munchi, that is a, a clerk or secretary, although it, 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 you know, that particular social function uh, it, it involves a very enriching uh, and a very elaborate humanistic Islamic education. So it's much more than just a, a clerk or secretary that we think of in modern terms today. Um, he was fluent in Persian, Arabic, and Turkish, uh, the administrative languages commonly used throughout uh, the Mughal Empire. Given his multilingual and translational skills, he conducted business and diplomacy for Mir Jafar, the Bengal Nawab, that is that was a title for the Mughal title for ruler or deputy. After 1760, Medin worked as a clerk, paymaster, and tax collector for Mir Jafar's successor, Mir Kazim, um, uh, and the company, his primary employer, even as he remained loyal to the Mughal throne. Defeated by the British and protected by the Nawab of Awad, Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II appointed the Munshi to help draft and sign the 1765 Diwani, that is the revenue collection rights, granted to the company, an English trading monopoly turned into an Indian sovereign. Uh, unable to commit the company to protect him from his enemies, the emperor prepared a letter addressed to King George III with a gift of lakh rupees, suggesting his uh, requesting his direct military support. For this diplomatic mission, Shah Alam appointed Sir Archibald Swinton, a Scottish captain and company employee, to be joined by a trusted Munshi. The emperor chose Itzimedin for his knowledge of Permish diplomacy and familiarity with British customs, conferring him with the honorific title Mijra, which means prince. But the delegation left Calcutta in January 1766 without the letter and gift. Because the company sought to protect its monopoly rights from government interference, for Northern India was legally considered a chartered territory rather than a colony in this time period, Robert Clive, the company's uh, governor, a very, you know, very coy politician, I might add, uh, suppressed the letter and, and offered the gift in his name. It's Medin now faced a personal and political crisis. With the promise of promotion in the Mughal court dashed, he was forced to perform an unprecedented role as representative of a foreign commercial organization masquerading as an indigenous territorial power. To cope with this, what he calls pathetic situation during his 33 month journey, arriving in England around January 1766 and returning to Calcutta in October or November uh, 1769, he made detailed notes of the quote unquote many rare and attractive things he saw there. So in other words, he had nothing better to do than write his travel diary. Yeah, yeah. Um, he recorded his observations of Nate, Callias, uh, and Scotland, staying for a short period in the first two ports and a half a year in the later kingdom. However, his time at Oxford and London, where he stayed three months each, introduced him to the theatrical and scientific wonders that he enthusiastically noted. In 1784 or 85, he wrote these notes as a safranamas, which is in Persian uh, a, a wonder book, right? Um, a Persian travel genre receptive to the different religions, languages, and literatures encountered abroad and woven into a fabulous ethnographic narrative to create inconsistent representations of foreign people. Such exotic portrayals made European cultural culture intelligible for Itza Medin's elite Indo-Persian readers, which is primary audience. Um, not exclusively, though, because it also could include uh, Persian-speaking uh, Britons as well. Uh, nevertheless, the manuscript ge uh, generated greater interest among company officials as it fell into the hands of James Edward Alexander, a Scottish soldier and prolific travel writer. In 1827, he translated and published an abridged English and Urdu edition 
as a textbook for educating East India Company recruits. So that's the primary pedagogical function to this text uh, in the colonial context. Inevitably distorted by colonial and translational process, Itzabuddin's narrative nonetheless promotes the Islamic ethos of adab, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, that is moral behavior, correct speech, and proper etiquette modeled after that of saints and prophets. An ethos also associated with an elite literary style often used by munshis to inculcate Mughal political virtue. Typical of the style and travel genre, his narrative is framed by Islam as most narratives are in this time, most of our phenomena in this way, right? Beginning with the, the traditional invocation, quote, in the name of the most beneficent and merciful Allah, to whom all praise is due, et cetera, et cetera. And ending with, quote, unquote, praise and thanks to the Almighty. Adab is exalted toward the end of the narrative when he claims that he follows the examples of, quote, my ancestors who were Saeeds or descendants of the Prophet. And some of them were of the family of the Prophet's companions, end quote. Although his claim to a Sayyid lineage cannot be verified, he expresses a pan-Islamic ideal that enjoins elite Muslims to serve as models for social inferiors by imitating the humble lives of Prophet Muhammad and his associates. But unable to fulfill his diplomatic mission, the Mizra turns to the worldly pleasures he later repudiates. The theater is unresistible for him after all. Englishwoman's unveiled display of beauty is unlike anything he saw in India where women observe purda, that is seclusion, and when in public are entirely concealed in clothing. For him, unconcealed gender intermingling in public spaces can be compared only to a Muslim heaven on earth, as when he visits a Dover ball. So this is uh, on your handout, uh, number one, on the bullet point. So I'm going to go ahead and read that quote. And this is his encounter in the Dover ballroom. Uh, one day, some people took me to a dance party at the house of one of their friends. As soon as I entered, the music and dancing stopped. The assembled ladies and gentlemen thronged around me in wide-eyed amazement and examined my robe, turban, shawl, and other parts of my costume. They concluded that it was the costume of a dancer or actor and invited me to join the dance. I protested that I had no knowledge of the art of dancing, but they refused to believe me. They said there was nobody on earth who didn't know something of music and dancing. One of the English gentlemen said that I was newly arrived in England. As I was newly arrived in England, I was perhaps feeling shy to dance with ladies of another race. At this, the ladies tittered with amusement. They continued to stare at my clothes and countenance while I gazed at their astonishing loveliness. How ironic that I, who had gone there to enjoy a spectacle, became a spectacle myself. In such attractive company, I mused, even the wisest are apt to lose their wits. The ladies were lovely as hurries. Their beauty would have shamed even fairies into covering their pretty faces. I cannot distinguish the brightness of the lamps and the splendor of their appearance. Speechless with admiration, I stood like a statue and overwhelmed by the glory of Allah's creative power, recited this ditch to myself. Out of the dust, he produces a living body and from seed makes a fair face." End quote. This passage encodes a series of cross-cultural disconnections in which the Mizra and his social interlocutors lose control over, their over what their utterances and performances mean. Most strikingly, the dancers first confuse him for a disguised Englishman, an actor or dancer. But an English gentleman concludes that the newcomer, quote, was perhaps feeling shy to, dance, to, shy to dance with ladies of another race, end quote. The dancers insist that all people must know music and dancing, for upper-class Britons considered these activities as signs of elegant bodily behavior central for displaying politeness. So this is a common English understanding of what dancing entails. But the Mizra does not explicitly accept or reject their claim. His, his reticence registers social unease. The gentleman's remarks are potentially insulting and in attributing to him the racial and gender norms of European sociability. He inadvertently denies the Mizra's class, ethnic, and masculine identity by placing him in the same category as female notch performers, which are very common in India, right? Notch performers, rope dancers, and court entertainers. That's the repertoire that uh, the Mizra is familiar with. These low-class actors skilled in music and dancing were mostly foreign immigrants who settled in South Asia to pursue what elite Indians like the Mizra consider a disreputable, a disreputable uh, profession. Um, and this is really in between the lines, but we're talking about prostitution. He is shocked that the wives and daughters of the English circulate as objects of desire indistinguishable from the courtesans who entertained powerful men in, Mo in the Mughal court with music and dance. 
De Mijra therefore retreats into his performative repertoire, staging a mutual spectacle for constituting the self as other. He is as much an exotic object in the eyes of English women as they are in his eyes. He transports them to a phantasmagoric figural economy that his Indian readers would find familiar. These women appear as Houris, not the original heavenly virgins of the Quran, but an earthly imitation. Their beauty surpasses that of fairies, and their glorious appearance blends with the bright lamps. They are magical spectacles devoid of supernatural substance, mere mortals produced by Allah's creative power, from dust and seed to amuse men with a quote-unquote fair face. Such superficial beauty that makes the wisest lose their wits is nothing but a senseless, vulgar, and capricious performance. His representations of these women partly derive from the London entertainment for which his, as he, as he says, his pen lacks the ability not only to describe properly, but even to write a short panegyric, end quote. Presenting a quote, unquote, highly entertaining spectacle, playhouses are full of, quote, music from violins and guitars, many strange dramatic pieces, curtains of many colors, antics of habishi performers. And here, when he's thinking Habishi, he's, he's really recalling uh, black-faced uh, white actors that are mistaken for uh, uh, Indo-African acrobats, which were very common in, in street performances in India at this time. Um, and, and he also mentioned dancers uh, dressed like fairies, end quote. He offers vague yet salient descriptions of various dramatic venues, Vauxhall Gardens, where singers and dancers perform among pictures of fairy-like women. Philip Astley's early circus in a fenced area on Lambeth March called Halfpenny Hatch, a theater featuring a pantomime where, quote, people disguised as angels and fairies appear on stage and dance, and then subtly disappear, end quote. And a Haymarket Bazaar where a fairy-like giantess is exhibited in a street fair. These performances inflect his experience of offstage encounters with what he consistently describes as female fairies, or Paris, right? Uh, that's the, the Persian word for fairies. And, and I've also discovered that in the original Persian versus the colonial translation and even more modern translation, that word reappears over and over again more frequently. Um, and it, that really, and I've discovered recently, that this is really a code word for courtesans, um, often used in 18th century Mughal court poetry addressed to beautiful beloveds. But from all the performances he saw, pantomime made the strongest impression on his self-image. This dramatic genre features a mime named Harlequin, who through music, dance, and magic tricks enacts comical escapades. It's a Medine focuses on the actor's bodily acts rather than the accompanying scenery and music. So this is the uh, other quote I'm going to be looking on, uh, on section two, uh, bullet point A. Quote, there is an elusive man with a black face, a kind of devil called Harlequin, who appears and then hides himself, and sometimes attaches himself to the dancing girls, taking them by the hand and dancing with them, then scampers off and leaps through the window. At seeing his antics, I laughed very heartily. Demetra's hearty laughter registers his participation in a social economy of surplus affect that galvanized 18th century audiences across classes, languages, and nationalities. Originating in the Italian Commedia di Arte, Ro uh, Roman Italian farce, and even Turkish shadow theater, uh, there's a long lineage, uh, British pantomimes mobilized a vast cross-cultural repertoire for transferring social practices and norms. They, were, they are structured by what Taylor conceptualizes as quote-unquote scenarios that frame and activate social dramas, end quote. Uh, they, they do, and they do this through duplication and reiteration. These formulaic plot structures of pantomime, uh, they, they have, these are plot sketches that accumulate themes uh, scenes, behaviors, gestures, feelings, and characters over time and across cultures, unbound to any particular ideology or social outcome, preceding the written script and knowable only through reenactments, at once archival and embodied, uh, durable and transposable. The scenario's once againness immerses the spectator in its reiterative affects as sedimented historicity. Its open-ended setup explains why Britons repeatedly flocked to the theaters to see pantomimes and act the same bipartite plot structure. The first sung part features a historical or legendary persons who, in the second silent part, turn into dancing comedia de art stock characters, a devilish harlequin who uses his magic wand to assume various guises and steal his beloved fairy-looking Columbine from her father or husband, usually named Pantaloon. He then captures Harlequin, followed by a brazen escape that concludes with his moral amends. 
He renounces female fairies for an upright life. So this is the basic plot structure with a whole bunch of different variations and comic interludes in between. Mixing serious and comic elements, these shows encourage spectators to identify with unpredictable spectacles and transformations that constitute a British national identity. Pantomime's malleability, high, uh, malleable hybrid form activates a ready-made repertoire for an Indian foreigner to understand and evaluate bizarre social dramas in which female fairies mingle with men. On London Street, the Munshi assumes a protean harlequin-like character. Spectators see him as a Nawab, a Lasker, that is an Indian sailor, which are you know, very common you know, immigrants in this time period uh, in Britain, uh, a black devil. Uh, they see him as effeminate. The scriptures that he, a self-described Indian gentleman, uses to cast himself as a spectacle. And this is on, uh, again, in your handout, the second part, uh, B, bullet point B. So, and you could compare this passage to the previous passage, and you can see the very strong overlap in terms of, you know, the, the way he's thinking about his reiterative acts and, and his, his self-conception. When I went abroad, crowds accompanied me, and people cranked their heads out of the windows and gazed at me in wonder. Children and adolescents took me for a curious spectacle and ran into their houses crying, look, look, a black man's walking down the street, at which their elders would rush to the door and stare at me in amazement. Many children and small boys took me for a black devil and kept away in fear, end quote. He goes on to note that Britons were, quote unquote, pleased with my costume, the pajama trousers, loose shirt, strap dagger, shawl, and turban that some saw as, quote unquote, effeminate. After overcoming their initial fear, his neighbors, quote, would now jest with me, familiar, with, with me familiarly, end quote. And, quote unquote, ladies of the bazaar approached me and smiling said, come, my dear, and kiss me, end quote. These passages are emotionally resonant. Besides seeing himself as a costume actor, he appears as a curious specimen, a thing rather than a human, a black devil, even though the children call him only a black man, effeminate, a descriptor that he later applies to luxurious Indian rulers, and a comic figure, a figure to be sexually teased by the women. Theater goers often associated these attributes with the shape-shifting, eastern-dressed, and gender-ambiguous harlequin, a whimsical womanizer whose mysterious black mask signifies demonic magic. Itzabuddin correctly notes the mask's satanic symbolism, so he clearly picks up on that aspect of, of this repertoire. But he confuses the, this black mask with habishis, that which is Arabic for Africans or Ethiopians. That is, again, Indo-African street performers whose ancestors were brought to India from East Africa by Arab and Portuguese slave traders. It's Medin's adopted racial persona signifies an amorphous, savage otherness. For example, he describes the dark-skinned natives of Malacca as habishis who have, quote, sat satanical continences and bestial natures, end quote, end quote, do not care for any religion and lack all moral sense, end quote. And at the Cape of Good Hope, he calls Africa a habishi country. Uh, that is, you know, bordering on the quote-unquote land of cannibals. And, and he, in, in terms of Ethiopia, a Habishi kingdom inhabited by black infidels. Thus, his affective attachment to the mask's blackness imports the theatrical repertoire and very racist ideals he knew from home to the London stage. The black devil activates a liminal space for performing multiple identities, both civilized and barbaric, through which the Mizra can recreate his self-image for an alien country where he appears as exotic as the dark-skinned Malacans and Ethiopians, he, de he denigrates. So I'm going to move on to my next section, um, uh, subtitled, uh, Prophet Jesus Condemns the Materialist West. Itzimuddin's performative self was formed in a London theater he calls dance houses. And I think that's very interesting, right? Not too different in his mind from the Dover Ballroom, right? Uh, dance houses, an institution that he sees as symbolic of England's political economy. He describes the segregation of classes according to ticket prices and seating arrangements. And he notes the presence of the king in his private box. And he provides a lot of details in, in his travel uh, diary. Uh, the theater is almost identical to the East India Company for him uh, because these royal chartered corporate entities represent a perfect social order different from a corrupt Mughal one where, quote, the idle rich hire professional singers and dancers for private performances, and hundreds and thousands of rupees from the inheritance of their parents is squandered, end quote. By contrast, the English theater is a microcosm of economic efficiency. 
It's a Medin note that English, quote, economic intelligence can be deduced from, uh, this is just quote part of his phrase, the way theater managers generate profit by lowering expenses. And he provides a lot of notes on that. From his perspective, their business acumen appears as fabulous as the rituals of, quote, magician actors of rare skill. So the theater here is a microcosm of the British economy and a place, of course, of magic and mimesis. Thus, the Georgian theater provides him access to an Occidentalist ideal by which he, an Indo-Persian Mus Muslim, can participate in a Protestant social political economy. Indeed, he establishes various equivalencies between Anglicanism and Sunni Islam, and that primarily is his religious background and upbringing. Right? Um, he looks at them both and he, said the, the, he considers these Abrahamic monotheisms as refraining from worshiping images, paying allegiance to the Pope, observing superstitious rituals and sacraments, following priests and saints, promoting bigotry, and persecuting non-believers. For him, Anglicans are proto-Muslims who believe in God's essential unity, Tawid, right? even though they do not recognize Prophet Muhammad's final revelation. Right? And he also recognizes that as well, uh, as idealistic as he is. But ironically, Anglican and Muslim commonality serve as the basis for performing differences between a materialist West and a spiritual East through the adopted persona of Prophet Jesus, as described in the Quran and in Itza Medin's copy of a Persian translated gospels. In particular, the Mizra's retelling of the parable of the talents conveys an implicit critique of British worldly ambitions. In his version of the parable, a father gives money to his three sons and inquires what they did with it after his return journey. The eldest had his money stolen, the, uh, the second son returned the original sum, and the youngest returns the sum plus the profits he made from investing it. The overjoyed father entails his estate to this quote unquote wisest and honest son. So, and this is gonna be the, uh, the third quote here on your handout, bullet point three. Um, according to Itza Medin, quote, Hazrat Isa, that is Jesus, explained the meaning of the parable in this manner. Before God, it is so ordered that the individual who retains the whole of the original sums will have the whole made over to him. He who has retained less will have less given to him. And he who preserves nothing will be left with empty hands. Muslims interpret the parable as follows. The foolish man represents those who are ignorant and disobedient. The sum of money stands for faith. And the thief is the devil who steals the faith, the faith of fools and careless persons, who thereby are deprived of the Almighty's mercy and are cast into hell. The second son who squandered the interest represents the hypocrites, who have partial faith in God, but consider God's prophets to be imposters. Their place is also hell. The youngest son who by faith and good work not only presented his father with the original son, but also with a large prophet, represents the Muslims, for they attest God to be their nourisher by word and thought. They, re they rely upon God and do not deviate a hair's breadth from his laws and the injunctions of his prophets. They consider the world a perishable place, and in the hope of finding a permanent home in heaven, they lead a hard and austere life, gladly accepting difficulties and sufferings. They say that in this world are sown the seeds of futurity. after the Arab saying, the quote unquote, the world is the field of futurity. Surely they will without doubt see paradise. Muslims account worldly wealth useless and do not follow the examples of those who take great pains to acquire riches and are rewarded with nothing more than the enjoyment of wealth. The paradise of such people is this earth and they have no hope for entry into heaven." End quote. It's a, Medin ver uh, it's a Medin's version of this parable differs, of course, significantly from the gospels. The Bible tells the story of a master who gives different sums to his three servants and receives from the first two the sum doubled and from the last one only half, and thus he is chastised and loses his last talent. By contrast, the Mishra's version, and perhaps modeled with, uh, with the parable of the uh, pro pro uh, prodigal son, reflects the lingo of finance capital. So, and I think this is where the emphasis is, right? Profits made from savvy business transactions that earlier he associates with English theater practices. Christians interpret the parable as a story about those who return more to God than they have received from him. So the talents uh, signify differing degrees of devotion. And of course, I'm, I'm sort of alighting here that there's you know, a large Christian tradition with various interpretations, but I'm not gonna get into that for, at this moment. 
Uh, but the Mizar interprets this story as extolling devout Muslims over fools and hypocrites, presumably Christians and Jews who mistake earth for paradise. The parable's critique of those who abandon heaven for worldly wealth most likely refers to Britons, who have accomplished scientific and technological wonders the Mizra admires, yet finds disturbing. These industrious people, quote unquote, do not attach much importance to prayer and reflect little on the afterlife. It's worth noting that a lot of those lines are excluded from the colonial translation. Uh, so this is not a version of Europe that uh, Britons would recognize uh, themselves in, right? Although Itzimadim praises English efficiency and thrift over an Indian society plagued by indolence, waste, and luxury, the former system is built on this worldly knowledge. His descriptions of the English labor economy anticipates Max Weber's account of Europe's unique Protestant work ethic, except that the former treats this ethic as driven jointly by economic and aesthetic factors. He explains that the English consider their material possessions a sign of divine election, a Calvinist universe in which, quote, God has sent man to this world to enrich and beautify it, end quote. For the Mizra, the English believe they are on a divine mission to improve the earth materially and aesthetically, innovative aesthetes who create a spectacular world in their self-image. Conversely, quote, the man who spends all his time in prayer and grows weak from fasting and chanting on an empty stomach, end quote, is a harbinger of ungodly anarchy. And he actually uses that word anarchy paying, quote, scant importance to religious observance like prayer, fasting, and ritual chanting, end quote. English Farangis believe their hard work and fragility will save them on Judgment Day. An Occidental economic rationalism, the Mizra exalts by comparison to Oriental excess, but condemns by contrast to a virtuous Muslim asceticism. By the end of his narrative, Itzimuddin firmly rejects this rationalist Occidentalism for its un-Islamic view of an enchanting paradise as illusory, vulgar, and ephemeral as the one he enjoyed in English dan dance houses, like ballrooms and theaters. Singling his fallout with Captain Swinton, who's you know, his companion on this diplomatic mission, right? he claims, quote, that between your manners and customs and ours, there's the difference of East and West. This is a very sharp declaration of what the way he's imagining cultural differences here. Right? He arrives at this conclusion in response to Swinton's economic objections. This is what he calls them. Um, it, Swinton attempts to persuade him to eat haram foods and avoid prayers and abolitions to expedite their overland journey, an efficient means of reducing the carriage expenses for transporting cooks and servants. The captain also wants the Indian elite to accompany him on an extended visit to Europe where they would enjoy, quote unquote, many curiosities and spectacles. The Mizra claims that the captain's desire to see Europe is a pretense to advance his social status by getting him to drop his religious scruples and play the role of an indulgent oriental prince. Quote, see me in my Indian gentleman's costume, end quote. Ignorant Europeans would think that Swinton was connected to, quote unquote, a nobleman, perhaps a Nawab's brother, and would infer that the captain must have risen to great eminence in Bengal, end quote. And declining to visit Europe, the Mizra disowns his previous performative self, the costumed foreigner who appears as a spectacle for others. These pretentious performances are now tainted by economic rationalism. After the frustrated Swinton calls him a stupid Mangali, and that's really where, the, where, the, where this travel narrative, the narrative ends, really, and this you know, personal fight between both of them. Um, the Mizra, as in his reading of the Parable of the Talents, uh, retorts, and this quote is not on your handout, so I'm going to read it out loud. Among Muslims, true nobility is measured by worldly wealth, but consists in acquiring knowledge, in leading an upright life, and in obeying the laws of Allah and his prophet. If the pride of wealth or the devil's temptations prompts any person of rank to act contrary to his religious precepts, he is definitely culpable, and therefore there is no reason why a Muslim of humble rank should follow his example, end quote. And, and again, it sounds very much like his interpretation of the parable, right? He adds that, quote, I would much rather live in poverty in my own country than in affluence in yours. And to me, the dusky Indian women are dear than the fairy-faced Farangi damsels, end quote. These passages are unconsciously laced with faint traces of the London entertainments he immersed himself in. He, his return to a Muslim Indian identity is mediated, paradoxically, by the theatrical persona he now repudiates, a repentant harlequin devil renouncing, quote, unquote, fairy face for Angzi damsels. Their uncanny reappearance in a concluding scene of moral uplift 
imbues his preference with melodramatic irony. For the demonic temptation of a false metropolitan paradise is condemned in a didactic ending strongly reminiscent of pantomime's demystification. Here's the final scene when spectators imagine an ethical alternative in miming the actor's self-transformations. So there's an element of very strong mimesis going on here, unconsciously. In preferring, quote unquote, dusty, uh, dusky Indian women, a metonymy for a black spiritualist, over, quote unquote, fairy face Ferangi damsels, a metonymy for a white materialist West, the Miser appropriates the racial and gender ideologies enacted in performative spaces like the Dover Ballroom. In the Sharaf Ignama Velayat stages the ultimate failure of cross cultural relations, which is where this narrative ends. Then it also serves as a stark reminder that this failure is underwritten by an Occidentalist fiction. The Mughal emissary is able to distinguish Indian from European civilization, in part by selectively drawing on social knowledge and habits enacted in London theaters. Popular performance such as pantomime mediate the Indian generic repertoires the Mishra uses to understand Fering the Ferengi social dramas he keenly participated in. These complex mediations transform his identity in response to the personal crisis he faced as a representative of conflicting political interests, Mughal and British. By using a performative lens to interpret his writings, I have shown that 18th century British entertainments inspired cross-generic convergences in his narrative for staging an irresolvable conflict between East and West. That Itzimuddin's actions echo Harlequin's mischievous exploits and eventual moral restitution suggest both the suppleness and limitations of his Mughal Persianate cosmopolitanism and his enthusiasm for Britain's imperial theater literal and metaphorical. Religious sensibilities are transposed across cultures in order to forge a new pluralistic community torn apart by unbridgeable differences. Thank you very much. <laughs>